<clears throat> hey everybody, it's Frankie Slauson here, and uh, welcome to another edition of the Frankie Slauson Show, and I finally got the guy I've been waiting to interview for a while, he's been a little busy, but uh, uh, we were finally able to do this interview today, and, is, and the guy I am inter- interviewing today is uh, legendary filmmaker Adam Rifkin, how's it going man? Good man, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing okay. <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm happy that we uh, uh, that you're giving me this opportunity to talk to you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, and uh, uh, most of if uh, if most of the people that are listening to my show right now uh, uh, have Showtime on their uh, cable box or satellite dish, uh, you just recently uh, uh, completed the first season of your hit show, uh, Reality Show. That's correct. Reality Show just uh, just finished up its uh, its run, but. You can check out the episodes on Showtime On Demand. So, like, uh, where'd you get the idea to, to do a show like that? Well, I had done a movie and a TV show prior called Look. The the movie was uh, an independent, and uh, the TV show was also for Showtime. And that movie and that show explored the idea that the average American is captured on surveillance camera 300 times a day. Uh-huh. And so we followed we followed interweaving storylines, um, but everything was shot from what was supposed to look like surveillance cameras. It was supposed to look like uh, it was all pieced together from actual footage from surveillance cameras, cell phone cameras, all the cameras we live in front of on a daily life, now, on a on a daily uh, basis. All the cameras we live our lives in front of. Sure. So after the the movie uh, and the series were done. I kind of felt like I had uh, explored surveillance as much as I wanted to, but as is always the case whenever I do anything, I feel like I get my best ideas for the project once the project's finally done, and I, I can't do anything to change it anymore. <laughs> I'm always kicking myself. I, w- I always think to myself, like, oh, I wish I had thought of that three months ago. Um, and that happened then with this. I thought to myself, God, you know, with all this surveillance stuff that I'd been dealing with, I didn't deal with somebody being intentionally put under surveillance. I dealt a lot with the eye in the sky, Big Brother, you know, all the all the official surveillance cameras and all the little brother, like, you know, like I said, cell phone cameras, Twitter, Facebook, all the ways we keep ourselves under surveillance voluntarily. Sure. But I'd never but I didn't have a chance to um, explore somebody being purposely put under surveillance. So then I thought, all right, well maybe I'll come up with a new project that deals with that. What would be an interesting reason why somebody is under intense surveillance? Uh, I thought, well, the government could have somebody under surveillance who's a criminal, but, but we've all seen that before. <laughs> oh, sure. And then I, I thought maybe a private detective is, you know, having somebody under surveillance because the, uh, somebody's spouse thinks somebody else is cheating, but that's boring. We've seen that before. <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, one thing I hadn't really ever seen is what if, what if a reality show producer picks an all-American family, and without their knowledge, he puts their whole family under complete, all-encompassing surveillance for a show that they do not know they're the stars of. <laughs> and I thought, all right, well, that could be kind of fun to explore, and that's where the idea came from. No, and that's, that's pretty interesting, because, you know, I watched the show a little bit. I don't have Showtime, but I, I, I uh, was able to, to watch the episodes uh, with uh, Sean C. Phillips and Brenda Mitchell, who are good friends of mine on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it seemed like a pretty good concept. Uh, and the fact that these guys had no idea, I mean, that's uh, the myth of surprise, more or less. Yes, and one of the things that I really wanted to show was that... Um a, uh, you know, first of all, all reality shows are fake. For people who don't, if, if anybody out there listening doesn't know that by now, you should now know that, because I'm telling you, it's all fake. It's like pro wrestling. Everything to do with reality television is, is manufactured by producers and writers, and and uh, it's, it's all staged. So this reality show producer, who I actually happen to play the part of the producer, um, he... Uh, he at first wants to, he had, he had produced many reality shows, all of them, you know, totally, you know, staged. But he wanted to do a reality show that was real. So that's why he put a family under surveillance without the knowledge. He wanted to just capture real life and present it to the, uh, the public. But because the family is boring, he 
um, was sort of forced by circumstance to have to mess with them and uh, make the show more interesting by adding conflict into these people's lives. So I wanted to really show the lengths that a reality show producer will go to to make his show better at the expense of you know anyone in his path. And so as as he starts to mess with these people and ruin their lives, the show is working way better, but their whole family is is you know in a downward spiral and is is coming apart at the seams and it, it's very dark from there. Huh. Well, it sounds like a very interesting concept for a show, and uh, are you planning on doing, like, a second season at all? We'll see. I mean, it all really up, uh, it's up to Showtime. You know, the ratings were really great, and the uh, response was really great, so, you know, hopefully we'll get to do another season. That'd be fun. And then you got a big fan base, too, because everybody that has, whether they've been living on a rock or whatever, should be familiar with some of your work. And, and the one that I like, you know, that you've done, Pyle, everything that I that I know that you have done is uh, the movie Detroit Rock City, which uh, I actually own the uh, New Line Platinum Series Edition, which uh, has all the features and everything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the only question I have for you for, uh, based on that is, uh, when will it ever come out on Blu-ray? Yeah. That is a great question. First of all, thank you for saying nice things about it. Um, we would love for it to come out on Blu-ray. Uh, and so what I would say to everybody who wants it to come out on Blu-ray as well is contact Warner Brothers. They own it. And please let them know that there's a demand for it. Yeah, because, I mean, uh, maybe they, you know, if you guys ever did put it on Blu-ray, maybe you could uh, find all the, the original cast and uh, do like a... A special documentary or something on there because that'd be oh, like, we've a, got, like an updated we've documentary. Got so, oh yeah, we've got so many great uh, um, extras that nobody's seen, and everybody involved would love to come back and be a part of the, the updated documentary. Everybody is, you know, really happy with the film, and everybody's proud to be a part of it. And and uh, we'd all love to do something like that. And, I, and I'm surprised that I haven't really, you know, like I said, I got the DVD of it, but I haven't really been seeing it aired on TV at all. You know, I, I, I don't remember, maybe I saw it on TV one or two times way back in the day, but lately I haven't seen any pro, anything on TV based on that. I know, it's not in rotation right now. I, I uh, That's why I say, you know, contact Warner Brothers, because they're the ones who control it, and uh, I'd love it if... Uh, they saw what a demand uh, there was out there for it. So you graduated uh, in 1984 from the Chicago Academy of Arts. Uh, now, w was uh, film work something that you have always wanted to do, or or was uh, there something else that you wanted to do prior to just uh, the film industry? No, I only ever wanted to make movies, ever since I was as young as I can remember. I loved movies. Uh, my grandfather turned me on to movies when I was about four, he turned me on to monster movies. He bought me a, a magazine called Famous Monsters of Filmland, which was a popular magazine way back when. And uh, and also, I'm from Chicago, and there there was and still is a local television show called Sven Gulli. And Sven Gulli would show monster movies on um, television, and he was the host of the show. He would host the, uh, uh, you know, the, the movies every week. And this is how I fell in love with movies was originally through monster movies and so when I was very young I started making movies with my parents uh, home movie camera and that's all I would do my whole life growing up with all my friends is just make movie after movie after movie with the intention that eventually I was going to move out to Hollywood and learn how to make real movies when I was 17 I moved out to LA right out of high school and uh started knocking on doors and trying to find money to get movies made because there's no magic for making a movie <laughs> you just need the money that's all that is standing in you know the way of not making a movie to making a movie is the money I thought there was a little bit of movie magic as far as they say on when you're watching a Disney movie anyway <laughs> say, say that again I, I thought there was kind of a uh, something called movie magic I, I think they made well, a movie magic <laughs> well, there's, there's definitely movie magic when you're making a movie <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But in terms of getting a movie made, there's no magic to it. it. If you have money to make a movie, you're making a movie. That's really the only difference uh, between making a movie and not making a movie. 
So, uh, did you ever thought that your career would ever be as big as it became, as it has been? Because I consider your work more or less and everything that you've done, uh, like like up up there with like the Ron Howards, you know, the the Steven Spielbergs, uh, even uh, I don't know, like the Robert Zemeckis's and anybody that's done a big film, you know, that and, and you obviously have, and and I just consider your work uh, just as big as as somebody who uh, would be recognized in like a Hall of Fame or something like that. Yeah. Well, bless your heart, and uh, I just let me know what address to send you the check, because <laughs> that is fantastic to hear, and, and I'm forever indebted to you for, for saying that uh, publicly. Uh, thank you. No, I, I, I've always hoped that I'd get the chance to make movies, and even though I've been lucky so far, I mean, I there's so many more movies I want to make, and so many more stories I want to tell, so to me, it's just a job. I'm just, you know, I don't think about it in terms of um, where I fit on the chain of, you know, um, the success chain. To me, it, you know, I'm just a, I look at it like a, like a blue collar job. I go to work, I write these things, I try to get money to get them made. I, sometimes I get an opportunity to make them. I work real hard to get them made. As soon as it's done, I, I try to get on to the next one. I, I really don't think about it beyond that because I just love the process. So what what's the hardest project that you ever that uh, like I, I guess I could say what's the hardest project that you ever had to 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 get the money for to make or like you know well well the truth of the matter is most of them okay are super hard most of them are super hard um, getting the money to get a movie made is just really really hard because movies are very expensive as the amount uh, as, the, as movies are able to be made for less of an amount of money than uh, than they used to be, it gets a little easier if you're cool with making small independent movies, you know? Like, um, these days, you know, you can make a movie for next to nothing, which is good news for anybody out there listening who wants to be a filmmaker. Don't wait for permission to make a movie. Don't think you need a million dollars or $10 million or $20 million to get a movie made. You can make a movie for next to nothing. You can literally shoot a movie with the camera in your phone. You can edit it on software on your computer. You can you can upload it to YouTube, which is a worldwide audience, and you can promote it to a worldwide audience on Twitter and Facebook. I mean, and if it's good, it'll get you attention. So the good news is it's easier now than ever for anybody to get a movie made. The hard part is making it good. You've got to make a good movie for it to change your life. So who who was like your biggest inspiration? Like when you like when you decided that I want to make films as part of my career, but I needed I needed some inspiration. Who who inspired you to to get into the film industry in the first place? Well, you know anybody who's made a good movie to me is an inspiration because it's so hard to get a movie made. Period. Let alone a good one made. So I mean, there are some people who've made many good movies, and they're they're in my all time you know pantheon of hero filmmakers. I mean, Woody Allen is a huge, huge hero of mine. Uh, yeah, Hal Ashby is a huge hero of mine. Uh, Billy Wilder, Francis Ford Coppola. Uh, there's a you know Billy, uh, there's just a lot of people who've made a lot of really great movies that are a big inspiration to me. But there's also you know when I was growing up, I read a lot of I, I read a lot about independent films. Uh, because I wanted to figure out how to get, you know, my movies made, and I knew that just right out of the box I wasn't going to be given lots of money. So I read up on David Lynch getting Eraserhead made, and I read up on uh, uh, John Waters getting Pink Flamingos made, and I read up on Toby Hooper getting the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre made. These are movies that were all made for pennies and were huge hits, and, you know... um, I have become iconic. You know, Night of the uh, excuse me, Night of the Living Dead was a small independent movie uh, for George Romero, but it changed the world. You know, so um, those were those were nuts and bolts inspirations for me, as well as you know, filmmaker heroes of mine. Yeah, well, that sounds like a, a pretty good uh, eclectic uh, type of list, anyway, of, of uh, inspiration. Because you know, nowadays, you know, even if you're making a movie, you know, it. I don't know. I mean, I guess you got to come up with some a good idea and a g- good idea for a story. So, what what advice would you uh, give to anybody who? Uh, I guess you kind of did give some advice already, but like, like if somebody actually wanted to be like an actor or or like a, a writer, like or or any of the things that you've done in your career. What advice would you give to them? The advice I would give is just do it. 
You know, if you want to be a screenwriter, you better start writing a lot of scripts, you know, and make them good. You know, you got to take it seriously. You can't just wait for the inspiration to hit you and, and be, you know, all artsy-fartsy about it. You need to take it seriously like it's your job, because it is. And you, and you need to write just script after script until you get, you know, somebody uh, to read it that, that, mean, that matters, you know. Um, you need to... You need to make films. If you want to be a filmmaker, just make some films. Make short films. Put them on YouTube. Make make a tiny little feature film, you know, with uh, with your friends for no money. Look at Giuseppe Andrews, speaking of Detroit Rock City. You know, one of the actors in, in Detroit Rock City is a, is a guy named Giuseppe Andrews. Uh -huh. He has made so many of these tiny little, incredibly brilliant artistic feature films um, with, with no money. I mean, he makes these movies for mere hundreds of dollars. If you go on GiuseppeAndrews.net, you can stream some of his movies. They're the craziest things you've ever seen. Oh, wow. And they're brilliant. They're all they're all feature length and they're all an inspiration to anyone who wants to make a movie. Now, the mistake is just to say, Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna make a movie, I'm gonna make a movie and then just run outside right now and start shooting something. You need to know what you're gonna be shooting. You need to prep it. You need to make sure the script is good. You need to make sure you've cast good actors. You need to Take it seriously if you expect it to be uh, something that's going to change your life. I think the, the the movie that just recently came out here, either last year or the year before, uh, the movie Super 8 is kind of a good movie to watch for inspiration uh, in a way because uh, not so much the, 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 the bad guy or whoever the, the alien was, but like the, the kids that were making their, their films. They're doing it because they actually love to do it, not just because they were paid actors, but but because they actually love to do film in, in the movie. And uh, I thought that was a pretty neat concept. Very neat concept. Another movie I would take inspiration from, whether you like the movie or not, is irrelevant. Is uh, the original Paranormal Activity? Oh. That movie was made for a few thousand dollars. Uh, I know Oren Pelly. He shot it in his house. He was the whole crew. There was nobody else. He cast two actors to play the couple. They shot the whole movie in a week in his house. He didn't know anybody in the film industry at all. He just was hoping to make his version of He took inspiration from The Blair Witch Project, uh -huh. right? Which is another movie in the same vein, right? The movie got accepted at the, at the Slamdance Film Festival because it was good, because it scared the audience. It got a lot of attention. It got bought by DreamWorks. And it sat on the shelf of DreamWorks for two and a half years because they didn't know what to do with this tiny little movie. Are they going to remake it? Or what are they going to do with it? Eventually, they started <coughs> test screening it. It did so well in the test screenings that they decided to release it. They came up with this cool release plan. It made hundreds of millions of dollars and changed the world. So you can do it. You just need to make it good. And and now they're they're on Paranormal number four, or I think they just uh, re are releasing that one, or it has been released, Paranormal Act 2 and then I uh, just saw the trailer for the spoof of that, uh, A Haunted House. So the guy de the guy definitely inspired some people, anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> well, I tell you what, there, Adam, I, I want to say thank you, first of all, for letting me do this. Uh, I want to I wanna just tell you, uh, uh, you are kind of the reason why I kind of restarted up my interview series in the first place when I, when I talked to you back in August and then back in November and everything. And, you know, it's been kind of a whirlwind. And I know you're a busy guy, and... And you know, it's just great to know that uh, that people who who you wouldn't figure, you know, would actually run their own Facebook pages, actually talking to you in person, like like on the internet, you know, and then talking to you, it's like it's like we're in the same room together, and I think it's just it's so amazing. You know? Well, I love I love that about uh, you know current technology when I think about when I was young, if I had an, an opportunity to have access to some of the people that inspired me, I mean, that would have just been the greatest thing ever. So to me, it's a, a great opportunity to be able to communicate with uh, people directly who've seen some of my stuff, who maybe like some of my stuff, who want some advice, whatever. I'm happy to help, you know. And, and I've, I've always considered myself a big movie buff. Maybe I'm not, I don't have a big uh, collection like uh, Sean C. Phillips, but I do have a collection that I've that I've worked my butt off to have for at least the last 10, 15 years at least, and and I like posters and stuff like that, and I and I've always loved films. Uh, I'm a big Back to the Future nut. I'm a big uh, Ghostbuster nut. I mean, it's just anything that I find that's good, and and both and pretty much everything that I've seen of yours has been perfect, you know, to a T. And I'm not just saying that, you know. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. 
So anyway, this is Adam Ripkin, and, uh, and I'm Frankie Slauson. And uh, uh, once again, Adam, thank you very much for uh, taking the time to uh, talk to me. You got it, man. Thank you very much as well. All right. Have a good one. Bye. And that was the legendary, and I do mean the legendary, filmmaker Adam Rifkin. Finally, after it's been, I'll be honest, it's been a few months. Uh, originally, we were going to 2012. Oh, uh, to, uh, that's where I had the inspiration to continue doing these interviews because uh, I knew one day he would let me interview him, but it was just a whole lot of stuff going on. He was working on the show. Uh, the reality show that we just got done talking about, and uh, so, but now that it's a new year and everything, and now that I had a chance to talk to him, it's pretty nice to finally be able to do this, and it's like a goal finally accomplished. Now that doesn't mean that the that the interviews are over, <laughs> just because I got to interview the guy who I want to interview since I first restarted this whole interview series. It just means that I have accomplished this goal which is a big goal because it took this long to do it, but uh, it also means that uh, there are more bigger things to come. And I don't know when, and I don't know how, but one way or another, we're going to we're gonna keep this interview series going as long as it can go. As long as you guys have an interest, uh, please share it around. Oh, telephone for me? Okay. Anyway, <coughs> I'm Frank Slauson, and we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye. <laughs>